Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 1552 to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Once again, everyone, I'm your host, Ray Shasha. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on VBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. And by the Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1. My new book featuring over 45 intimate conversations with... The greatest music legends the world will ever know. Available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. The city of New York has been the epicenter of American music ever since Duke Ellington told composer Billy Strayhorn to take the A train from Brooklyn to Harlem in 1940. Sinatra, The Dolls, Run DMC, The Ramones, The Big Apple looms large in the works of so many iconic musical artists, but none more so than the garage rock legends, The Fuzz Tones. Founded in New York by Rudy Petrudi in 1980, the group became a mainstay in the New York underground before relocating to Los Angeles shortly after the release of their first album, the now classic Lysergic Emanations. From there, they became a worldwide phenomenon with multiple studio albums, an uncountable number of live performances, and a throng of fans who follow the band with a cult-like devotion. But Petruti and company never forgot from whence they came, and now celebrating celebrating an incredible four decades of rock and roll uh, perversion, the Fuzz Tones have put together a new album of studio recordings that pays homage to their home city, simply titled NYC. The album features... Uh, features the band's special twist on classics by the Ramones, the Cramps, Dead Boys, the Heartbreakers, the Fugs, Mick DeVille, Patti Smith, New York Dolls, and of course Sinatra's New York, New York, which has been made available as a digital single on all platforms. As Petruti explains, New York has always been at the core of the Fuzz Tones entity, so what better way to celebrate 40 years of fuzz than a tribute to the music that drew us there? Their brand new release, NYC, uh, will be available on both Digipack CD and limited edition colored vinyl starting October 16th via Cleopatra Records. Please welcome guitarist, songwriter, actor, and leader for garage rock legends, The Fuzz Tones, Rudy Petruti, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Rudy. Hey, how you doing? Hey, man. Congratulations on 40 years of fuzz. Thank you so much. D- does it seem like 40 years? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, yeah, <laughs> it does. It's been a long, long road, um, mostly a good road. Well, uh, I understand you were born in D.C. I so was I. I was I was brought up in D.C. Is that right? Yeah. Well, when did you leave D.C.? I, I was uh, born in the George Washington Hospital, and I was there till I was four years old. And then we moved to Pennsylvania, or as I like to call it, Pennsylvania. The only southern state north of the Mason Dixon line. Huh. Yeah, it's a shame you didn't stay longer in D.C. because actually D.C. had a really cool uh, music scene, you know? Well, actually, uh, before the Fuzz Tones, I had a band called Teen Appeal. Right. And we were very big in D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, we played there all the time uh, in 76 and 77. You know the the fuzz tones that you know they call you guys an American garage rock revival band. You guys were formed in 1980. 
Uh, I, I began my radio career in 1979, so I'm very familiar with all the music that came out at that time. A very eclectic mixture of music from new wave uh, to disco um, to punk. I mean, it was everything was on the radio, and I did top 40. But uh, you, you guys would have been huge in the 60s, man. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I'd like to think that. Yeah, especially but then during, again. I think we might have been maybe a little too much for the 60s. Because uh, an element of our music is the uh, more hard-driven stuff like Stooges and MC5, and right. there's definitely a punk element, uh, a 70s punk element to our energy level. So we, m we might have been just a little bit too heavy-duty for the 60s. Well, that, that, that probably would have separated you from the other guys, you know? I mean, um, it, it, I, you know, guys like MC5, and they were pretty heavy for, for that time. Absolutely. <laughs> well, they, they were a big influence on us. Uh, uh -huh. what, I, when I uh, try to describe our music to people who are not familiar with Garage, I tend to say, well, we're kind of like if the Doors and the Early Stones music was played by the MC5. You know, that's perfect. People a rough idea. I, I agree with you 100% because, you know, when I listen to the new album, I, I heard a lot of early stones, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. That's that's a perfect analogy there of how you guys sound. Huh. Yeah. During that time of the, uh, I think you mentioned it once before, there's, there's a brief period of psychedelia in the 60s that you know like the the electric prunes uh uh music machine you know all, all those guys question mark in the uh mysterians that it was a brief period wasn't it yeah it was really pretty much just from 1966 to 67 uh -huh. and then uh psychedelic music came in and uh turned it into something a little more serious more artsy uh Kind of less teenage, right, right. But the top, the top forty um, psychedelic music, the, the you know the stuff that made it to the radio was was excellent. You know, oh, yeah, it my was... God, yeah. If you listen to the uh, Nuggets album, mm -hmm. which was really the first uh, collection of uh, what we now call garage rock, right. uh, because we did not call it that in the sixties. That was a name that. Um, later by mm -hmm. critics but if you listen to that album there's some incredible music by bands who really only had one hit like the Blues Magoos or the Music Machine mm -hmm. uh, or, or the Seeds they only had one hit and uh, a lot of people never heard anything else by those bands until the Fuzz, fuzz Tones came out and covered some of their stuff yeah exactly and you know, you know, if you really listen to, you know, I was a big record collector. I used to go to conventions and things like that, and of course, find those type of albums. You know, you know, like, you know, find uh, another Seeds album that did not have pushing too hard on it. You know, I was really exactly. into you know, yeah. experimenting and finding all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, but you, you kind of have to be a musical connoisseur, you know, to really find that, you know, what be interested in that kind of stuff and go beyond That's top funny. forty. Yeah. <laughs> because um, I started playing in bands in 1966 hmm. and we did the seeds and we did uh, a lot of fugs and velvet underground and stuff hmm. um, but most of what we did uh, at first at least was just the easiest stuff on the radio because mm -hmm. uh, let's face it I was 14 years old I really didn't I wasn't that hot on guitar you know I knew some chords and some really really simple leads so like a lot of teenage bands we covered Louie Louie Gloria Hang On Sloopy right. Hey Joe the really really simple stuff but what you gotta realize is that was stuff from the radio that was top 40 yeah, exactly we didn't call it garage and when the fuzz tones started when I first started thinking about doing the fuzz tones was 1979 I had been in Teen Appeal and we were doing a lot of 60s oriented stuff but it was much more poppy we were influenced by bands like the Monkees mm -hmm. uh, 
Ziggy, Crying Shane, Dave Clark Five, stuff like that. Right. And uh, we played uh, with uh, a punk outlook. You know, our lyrics were punky, but we had three-part harmony, so it was kind of a combination of punk and 60s bubblegum. But when the fuzz, uh, fuzz Tone started, uh, I had kind of revived my interest in what they now call garage. Mm -hmm. And I can't honestly tell you why. I just started thinking back to that kind of music and I got interested again. And I went to a, uh, a record convention. Mm -hmm. And at the time, garage wasn't uh, popular whatsoever. Right. And I just decided I was going to buy some albums of some bands that I barely remembered. The Seeds, mm -hmm. uh, the Count Five, to see what else they did. I had only ever heard Push and Do Hard or Psychotic Reaction. Exactly. And the thing is, his albums were really cheap at the record convention, <laughs> like two bucks each. Exactly. Because nobody was listening to that yep. stuff. So I bought like a pile, and I went home, and I listened to all of it, and I just went nuts over it. <laughs> You know, because it was familiar. It was a style of music I played when I was a teenager. So it was familiar, but yet it was new. Mm -hmm. And that's what inspired us to start the Fuzz Tones. We just thought, man, wouldn't it be a trip to play this kind of stuff in 1980? Yep. And when we started playing it, it was like we came from outer space. <laughs> Nobody knew how to react to it at all. And it took about two or three years before we actually yeah. caught on. Well, you know, it was a weird time, 1980. You know, like I said, I was in radio, and you had this, you had uh, Donna Summer playing, you had the Cars, you had Blondie, you know, you had uh, Lionel Richie. You know, it was all across the board. You know, and you know, I was in top 40. Oh, we didn't, and don't forget Sticks. Sticks. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Boston. All, all this uh, yeah. Coliseum rock. You know, this really right. um, pretentious, overblown yeah. stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So it was it was a tough time. I mean, it was a I mean very eclectic period. But you know, I'll be honest with you, man. I might get in trouble for this, but I like you guys a lot more than I like the Ramones. You know, well, thank you. there's a big difference. <laughs> I mean, you. You, you, yeah, because I like that yeah, psychedelic sound. If you, you want to really compare the two bands, listen to Acid Eaters. Acid Eaters. Uh, that was their album that was influenced by the Fuzz Tone. Really? Uh, yeah. That. Very few people know this. Uh huh. But um, after Marky Ramone got kicked out of the Ramones, <laughs> we lost our drummer and our lead guitar player. Yeah. And Marky auditioned for us. Really? And Marky very much wanted to join the Fuzz Stones, mm -hmm. and he practiced with us for two weeks. And I hate to say this, because uh, he's great as a Ramone, but he couldn't swing. Right. He couldn't get the swing of our music, and we actually had to turn him down. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know Marky. He, he's been on the show a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, crazy thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, we also tried out the um, the guitarist for Sparks mm -hmm. um, off the Big Beat album. Mm -hmm. That guy, Jeff Salen, fantastic guitar player. Yeah. But uh, just didn't fit our style. Well, you guys are more advanced than they are. You know, I mean, you know, like the Sex Pistols and all those guys, the Dead Kennedys. I, I know you... Actually, an audition for the Dead Kennedys, right? No, the Dead Boys. Oh, the Dead Boys. Okay, I thought it was the yeah. Dead Kennedys. Yeah. No, I auditioned for the Dead Boys and, and actually played one show with them. It was a uh, was a benefit for Punk Magazine at CBGB's. Right. And uh, the night I played with them, uh, the bill was the Dead Boys, the Dictators, David Johansson, mm -hmm. Patty Smith, yep. Debbie Harry, uh, Blondie, yeah. and uh, Richard Hill, and Suicide. Oh, wow. All on one bill. That's incredible for such a small yeah. venue. <laughs> yeah, it was unbelievable, really. Yeah. And then they told me I was in the band. And I lived in Pennsylvania at the time, so I went home, mm -hmm. and I packed all my stuff, and I waited, and I waited, and about two weeks later, uh, Jimmy Zero called me up and said, well, uh, we decided to take our old bass player from from uh, Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. And I yeah. formed Teen Appeal and moved to New York by myself. Huh. And uh, you know, T Tina Peel was a good band. Uh, you guys played. I mean, you got you were pretty successful. You were on a lot of TV shows, the Uncle Floyd oh, yeah. show. Yeah, we were on three or 
four TV shows. Yeah. We did. Um, we were on the radio on big radio. Mm -hmm. uh, the two biggest New York stations. I don't remember their names anymore. Uh, but at that time, it, it was not uncommon for them to play up and coming bands. Right. And uh, we headlined the Ritz. We headlined Hurrah, the biggest clubs. <laughs> and it's funny because I broke up the band specifically to form the Fuzz Tones. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of crazy because we went from making a lot of money to making almost <laughs> nothing. <laughs> we went for two years making like 20 bucks a show. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta follow your heart, basically. You know? Well, that's it. I mean, you know, we knew what kind of music we wanted to play and we uh -huh. stuck it out. And thank God we did, you know. Yeah. But a couple of songs I like from Tina uh, Peel, Pajama Party. You know, I love oh, yeah. the sax in that, and Fifi goes pop. That's cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was a minor hit. Yeah, in, the, in New York, right? Jukebox hit. It was on all the clubs, jukeboxes and stuff. Yeah, great music, good music, man. Thank you. But I'm yeah, I'm glad you formed the Fuzz Tones though, because you know that's more my style. <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, we we formed Tina Peel in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. companies at that time, you know, I, I bet they were happy with them, with Tina Peel, you know. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? I, I'm sure the record companies were happy with Tina Peel, you know, for, for that well, reason. Well, no, not really. No. Uh, we had a couple of big labels following us around, mm -hmm. but they were, they liked our music, but they were a little hesitant because we were kind of... Um, You know, we had songs like Penis Between Us. Right, yeah. It's funny because now that could be on the radio. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's but funny. not in 1978, you know? Oh, <laughs> jeez. That's great. <laughs> so, I think that's what held us back. You know, we, uh, Fifi Goes Pop, I mean, it was about putting a poodle in a microwave oven <laughs> to dry it off. <laughs> that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, it's tongue in cheek, it's funny, but um, yeah. a lot of people were very, uh, a lot of record companies were very hesitant <laughs> to, uh, you know, to make our, they, they didn't think it was commercial enough, right, you know, right. because of the lyrics. And I guess at the time it, it wasn't really. Yeah, see, I can I can identify with that because you know when punk came out, uh, and I was in broadcasting school in Florida in Fort Lauderdale. We we started a band called the Drugs, and <laughs> we, we we had some we we had a song called Abortion Baby. So <laughs> oh, boy. I, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> that's that's funny because there was a band in uh, in New York called the Sick Fox. And, uh, oh, they did a song called My Baby Had a Teenage Abortion. Oh man. <laughs> You know, it was a fun time. <laughs>
have to go all the way from Lower East Side to uh, Uptown, you know, and you'd have to try to get there safely, which was very hard. If you, <laughs> even if you could afford a taxi, they drove like maniacs mm -hmm. back then. And if you took a subway, you might get knifed or mugged or whatever. Jeez. So it was, uh, it was really a challenge, and it was very exciting. You know, I mean, I actually liked the danger aspect, believe it or yeah. not, because it, it made every night an exciting uh, adventure. <laughs> yeah, it makes and a better song. And they were amazing bands. I mean, you know, the Heartbreakers played at least once every month. Right. Must have seen them 60 times. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, uh, Dead Boys were playing all the time. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of great stuff. Oh yeah, good good stuff back then. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, I like I liked um the uh shoot. Uh, I just lost it. Uh Take Me to the River. Um Oh the Talking Heads? Yeah, talking the Talking Heads, but um God who I, I just lost it. Oh, um they they did the Dion Warwick song, uh Walk On By. Mm. They, 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 they did it so cool, you know, like a punk version of it, it was great. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's another thing. A lot of those bands mm -hmm. uh, delved a little bit in garage punk as well. I mean, yeah. uh, Richard Hell did I Can Give You, I Can Only Give You Everything, mm -hmm. Patty Smith did Gloria, uh, Television did um, Fire Engine mm -hmm. by the 13th Floor Elevators, uh, Dictators did California Sun, uh, Dead Boys did Little Girl. Mm -hmm. You know, so they all paid homage to the original punk. <clears throat> I mean, 60s Garage is the original punk, right. you know. It's the original Teenage Rebellion music. Well, I, you know, I, and, think, uh, I think punk goes back to the 60s, in my opinion, you know. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. That's what I mean, listen to the Sonics. Yeah. And how about the Stones? I mean, early some of the Stones music was kind of punk, I, I thought. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. They're the bad boys. You, you know, it's interesting, it was your relationship with uh, Screamin' Jay Hawkins. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was a good friend of mine. Yeah. And, yeah, man, that guy's been around for a long time, but I think he kind of, you know, made, made a, a resurgence, I guess, of his career. You kind of helped him out a little bit? No, I'd like to think so. Uh -huh. I mean, when I met him, he wasn't doing very good. Right. He was just playing in a in a rib joint hmm. uh, in Greenwich Village, and he was playing to uh, about thirty yuppies who were drinking beer, eating ribs, and had absolutely no idea who he was. Wow. He was just sitting there playing piano, huh. no band, and he wasn't even playing his own stuff. He was playing uh, R and B hits, you uh -huh. know, by Fats Domino and Big Joe Turner, stuff right. like that. And he was uh, doing a three night stint so I just went every night and during his breaks I talked to him and got to know him and uh, when I when I felt we had a rapport then I propositioned him to uh, let me introduce him to the label that we were on mm -hmm. which was a very small label and I told him that you know uh, it was Midnight Records in New York mm -hmm. but I from what I saw he wasn't doing good at all and he could use a record, you know, putting a record out, and uh, so I arranged for him to meet the guy who uh, who ran that label, and it could never really come to terms because uh, Jay was a little bit unrealistic with <laughs> his expectations. So what we did was convinced him to do uh, an appearance with the Fuzz Tones Live. Mm -hmm. Tape it. And it 
it came out great. So I <laughs> took it to the record label and they put it out, and that was the record. Uh, he never went into a studio to cut a, an album for the right. label, but we put out these four songs, and they really took off. I mean, it mm-hmm. got absolutely nothing but great reviews. That's awesome. <laughs> and he started playing really good venues, and yeah. then he started touring, and mm-hmm. he started Oh yeah, definitely. I think so. I, I saw you. You did an interview with Larry King, right? I did. Yeah. I, I I don't want to. I, I hope you're not buddies with this guy, but I I I, I think he's a big idiot. With Larry. <laughs> Larry King. I can't stand Larry Why King. Why do you all wear your hats so long? <laughs> exactly. In or out? Exactly. What stupid questions does he ask? <laughs> Holy crap! Uh, I well, if you listen to that interview, you'll see that I was making fun of him the whole time. <laughs> I mean, you know, the guy was so uh, out of date that I decided yeah. it would be really fun to use terminology <laughs> from his day. So, you know, he'd say something like, uh, did you ever get a haircut? And I'd say, <laughs> yeah, when I was a tyke. Yeah. I mean, nobody uses the word tyke. That's something they used <laughs> right. in the Yeah, he says, uh, can you can you hum me one of your tunes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're unhumble, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these so-called legends, they don't do any homework when it comes to, you know, musicians, you know, which is, no. it's a travesty. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, it bugs me yeah. a lot. <laughs> it, but I'll tell you what, I was really happy to have gone on their show because, right. I mean, the guy's huge. Yep. Do you have any kind of side job that helps you financially? I just talked to uh, Albert Bouchard of Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, he was oh, a drummer, right. original guy. Uh, yeah, just talked to him, and uh, he, I didn't know this. He, he was a he's a music teacher for for a long, long time. He was also a taxi driver, and he did all this after Blue Blue Oyster Cult because he needed the money. <laughs> oh yeah. So, um, believe it or not, no. No, huh? You're... No. Uh, when we were at our peak, right, in about 1985 to 87, 88, uh, we we were really big. Mm-hmm. We were playing for 1,500 people a night, right. headlining, and often we'd be on festivals playing up to 20,000 people a night. But we had a very crooked record label. We had a very crooked booking agency, and we made no money. Somebody did, but it wasn't Somebody us. Did, yeah. But in my later years, after I moved to Berlin, I got a tour manager who was honest and also uh, my girlfriend <laughs> so the, and the organist of the band. Oh, good. So that helped very much yeah. because suddenly we were making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh we just redistributed where the money would go. We right. cut out the uh, the middleman. We cut out roadies. Mm-hmm. We cut out merchandise people. We did everything ourselves. You know, we uh, no longer brought equipment with us. We had the clubs mm-hmm. provide it. We changed everything. Really, very smart. And I'm able to make a living. Yeah. So um, I just bought a house. Congratulations. Doing fine. Excellent. So uh, it's funny because we don't play for anywhere near fifteen hundred people anymore. Well, you're big in that area, right? That's that. I oh think, yeah. Yeah, like you know, I know Susie Quattro. She's in England and she's never All left right. England. And the same thing, you know, she's big over there. You know. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, we only toured once in America for two weeks. Right. Uh, in the Midwest, mm-hmm. when all we had was one song on a compilation album. Right. Uh, once we got signed to RCA, the um, we got we got an offer to uh, to do a cross country tour from the famous uh, booking agency um, FBI, mm-hmm. which um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. There were three brothers. 
uh, the Copelands. Stuart Copeland is a uh, drummer for the police, right. and Ian Copeland was the um, the booking agency, and mm-hmm. Miles Copeland was the record mm-hmm. label, IRS. Yep, I know Miles. <laughs> What happened? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I shocked him by saying no. <laughs> you shocked him, right? <laughs> so we were blackballed. Uh, and to this day, we've never toured in, uh, America again. Four yeah. years. I've, I've heard mixed, mixed reviews about Miles. I've had him on the show. Um, well, this was Ian. I don't oh, know it was Miles. Ian. It wasn't Miles. Okay. But but you should ask the cramps about Miles. Yeah, I know. I know. Same I've heard deal. Some, yeah. Same deal. It, it, it's, he kept them in years they couldn't record it's crazy business <clears throat> yeah I, i'm the kind of person who likes to name names because uh, mm-hmm. a lot of these people are really crooked and they've really screwed bands over the years it's a shame. so really people is. really need to know who they are i agree 100 percent. you know i talked to tommy james about you know i mean he had the mafia <laughs> running his oh, label. yeah <laughs> screaming jay had that problem too really yeah yeah i don't know if you know but um i wrote a I heard. I guess four or five years ago, and yep. and I go into it a lot of detail, a Good. lot of names. I'm going to buy it, uh, and I'm going to promote the hell out of it for you, okay? Cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely yeah. want to talk about the new album, okay? Um, yeah, here's what I heard. Here's here's the kind of bands I heard. Oh, by the way, the, the band I was trying to think of that did the Dion Warwick thing, the Stranglers. I was think, trying to... Oh, yeah, that was... Uh... Yeah. That was an English band. We played with them in Team Appeal. Good band. So, really good band. Good but, band. But I hear, hear I hear a lot of things in you. I hear the pretty things. I hear oh, yeah. the, the electric prunes, the doors, the seas, the rolling stones, the music machine, Hawkwind, Stranglers, Question Mark and the Mysterians, and I can go on and on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. great. But not just 60s stuff. I mean, you can hear the Stooges. Oh, yeah. Hear, um, yeah. Blue Cheer. Yep. You can hear the Fugs. You mm-hmm. can hear um, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo yep. Diddley, uh, uh, Sonny Boy Williamson. Well, I'm giving you five stars, man. Five New York stars all, all the way. I mean, they're all, they've all influenced <laughs> in some way, you know. Five stars all the way. Favorite songs, Flip Your Wig, you know, <clears throat> one of my favorites. Wayne County, yeah. Yeah. You guys did a great version of that tune. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say, the, the, pronounce this right. Is it uh, psilocybe? Psilocybe. Yeah. Psilocybe. That, that's a uh, magic mushroom. That is that you singing on that tune? Yeah. But you sound like Jim Morrison, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One of my favorites. Big influence on me. Very cool. Talk a little bit about the album, about you know making it. Well, um. My concept was to uh, to basically do a, an homage to uh, the music from New York that influenced us in one way or another, mm-hmm. uh, and you know to pay homage to New York City itself. So the song "New York, New York" by Sinatra right. that's an anthem, and I thought, well, let's see if we could make it sound like we wrote it. Exactly. So we rearranged it to, uh, you mm-hmm. know, to be a fun song, song, and that starts out the album. Yep. So it's an introduction to what it's going to be about. And uh, we cover Richard Hell, Patti Smith, uh, New York Dolls, um, some some stuff that uh, isn't that well known, like the Fugs. We do a mm-hmm. Fug song that I actually played in 1966 in my first band. Oh. Uh, we do uh, Psilocybe is by a so-called garage revival band from the 80s called the Mad Violets that mm-hmm. most people don't know about. Uh, there's a song by John Collins on the album. It's called Man and Me. Mm-hmm. Uh, this band, John Collins' band, they uh, opened for Teen Appeal, but I honestly don't remember them. I just read in my journal mm-hmm. recently. And 
and the only song I've ever heard by them is Man in Me. It's mm -hmm. on a uh, Max's Kansas City compilation from the late 70s, mm -hmm. and it's a great song, so we just decided to put that on. Uh, Mink DeVille, DeVille, we covered them, and uh, I don't remember what else is on there. <laughs> You guys definitely have your own sound. I mean, you know. Thank it's you. Just, well, we, just, we ought to. We've been doing it for 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we've, you know, we've perfected a style that you, people can you identify do have a style. when they hear it. You do have, you have a great style. A couple of tunes that really sounded like early Stones was Skin Flowers. And um, another one was Let Me Dream with the harmonica. Oh, yeah, opening. yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's Bing DeVille, yeah. Let Me Dream. Mm -hmm. and, Killer riffs, man. Your guitar, I believe it's your guitar, on uh, Transmaniacon, is that how you spell it? Transmaniacon. Maniacon. Transmaniacon MC. Yeah. Yeah, that's a Blue Oyster cult song. That's yeah. That's in New York, too. Great, great sound on that one. I mean, you're, oh, that, that was your guitar work, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm the only guitarist on the album. Excellent. I'm also the bass player, too. <laughs> who, who needs the rest of the band? <laughs> <laughs> you can do like a Todd Rundgren thing, you know. Just um, actually, I'm I'm thinking I might do that on the on the next release. I'd I'd really like to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you've got all the uh, you know all the talent f to do it. Might as Thank well. You. Yeah. Do, do you do you have a well, actually all the all the vocals are mine too. All the harmonies. Do you, do you have a studio in your house? No, I wish. Uh, yeah. I have a garage band. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you guys it's play? Really rough stuff. Didn't you guys play in a parking lot once, in a, in, in, in a underground parking lot or something like that? Yeah, we did. That was our very last Halloween show. Uh -huh. uh, we we had a place here that we would uh, play every Halloween in Berlin. Uh, it was a, a club. Mm -hmm. It was the closest thing Berlin had to CBGBs. It was very similar in atmosphere. It was called the Bassy. acoustics like in there terrible terrible huh yeah <clears throat> just another reason not to do it you know mm -hmm. but uh but we tried something i mean you know that's sure. the thing about the five tones we're we're not afraid to try something new something uh something unexpected i like to do the unexpected right uh one thing you know frank zappa mentioned this and I thought he was 100% right on this. He said that um, at one time you had these, you know, cigar chopping guys that made decisions in the music industry. They, did, they didn't know anything about it, but they took a shot. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you know, Frank, he, his, his song was very out there. You know, it, you wouldn't think it would have made top 40 or, you know, even on the radio. But then he said when the hip guys came in that thought they knew everything, they ruined it, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I've seen that a million times. We had the same problem uh, with Fuzz Tones. Mm -hmm. We got signed to uh, Beggar's Banquet. It was a big English label. Right. And uh, we recorded the album in heat. And we did it ourselves. Uh, we found a small studio that was cheap, but got the, the kind of sound that we wanted. A nice, rough, nice, rough sound. 
Mm -hmm. We recorded the album, gave it to them, and they said, it's too rough. We want you to go into a proper studio with a proper producer. Up to that point, we had only produced our own stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of names were bandied about. Like, for instance, uh, Hunt Sales Mm -hmm. from Iggy Pop's band. You know, you made a statement in another interview that was right on, man. You, you, the, I think the interviewer said, if you could change one thing in the music world and it would become a reality, what would that be? And you said mainstream radio p- would play all styles. There's room for everything. And that's yeah, well, 100% that's what right. they did in the 60s. Yeah. You know, it's funny, but if you think about it, or, or if you were there, you'd know that in the 60s they, uh, they didn't have the format they mm-hmm. have now, you know, like exactly. now it'll be hip hop radio, blues radio, country radio. Oh, but yes. in <laughs> the sixties they would play well they would call it pop, but it was a huge umbrella, you know, you right. could have Frank Sinatra singing That's Life yeah. followed by the Beatles doing We Can Work It Out, exactly. followed by the Seeds doing yep. Pushing Too Hard, yep. followed by Napoleon the Fifteenth, doing they're going to take you away, (laughs) followed by uh, Prince Buster doing the Ten Commandments, which could never ever be played now because it's the most misogynist thing you ever heard. How how about Arthur Arthur Brown and Fire? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, a huge array of stuff. Petula Clark doing Downtown, followed by Talk Talk by the Music Machine. Yeah. Very sad. It is. Yeah, because you know, I was a, I was a, that I went to school for that, and the, I became a DJ because of that, because of that era, because of the '60s DJs and and all that. That's why I I did it, because I love that era, and uh, you know, it, there's no reason why they can't do it again. And no, I, I do isn't. I do this show because I, I love what I'm doing. It's not because I'm I'm not getting paid, you know. 
I pay for the time. Because I love the music, I love these guys I grew up with, you know, and I want to promote them. Because who else is promoting these guys, you know? You're absolutely right. And the musicians need people like you to do this, you know, because uh, it, it has to be a labor of love. It's got to be a labor of love, right? Exactly right. I mean, for a while we had uh, little Steven mm -hmm. championing this kind of music. Right. But as soon as his uh, his station, his his um, his show got popular, then he started to sneak in Randy Newman, yep. Bruce Springsteen, yep. uh, on and on until mm -hmm. it was like hard, hardly recognizable as the <clears throat> quote underground garage. <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. And this is something else that always happens. Well, that, that's the other thing. We we had a lot of underground stations. We had a lot of underground stations back then too, you know, that played yeah. played stuff nobody ever you know heard of. It was great. Well, that was another thing uh, that was different in the '60s mm -hmm. when I grew up, uh, all the way up to the '80s actually. Mm -hmm. uh, me and my friends, we would go to record stores and we would just go through the bins, and if we saw right. an album cover that looked intriguing, exactly. We would buy it, mm -hmm. not having a clue what the music sounded like. But part of the fun was, well, this album cover really looks intriguing. Let's mm -hmm. go home and see what it sounds like. Yep. And almost all the time, it was great. Yep. You know, this is how I learned about the Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. I bought the album because it said Andy Warhol on the cover, and mm -hmm. it had a uh, banana that you peeled away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the original ones, you could peel the banana. <laughs> They had a lot of cool stuff. You know, you open up uh, and and, you, and there's like a, sometimes a poster. You know, you read, you got to read the liner notes. Uh, I mean, it was all interesting. You know, the, the whole album uh, thing was it was fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's uh, Rudy. Here's a question I ask everybody, and I, I get some really interesting answers. If you had to feel the dream's wish, you know, like the movie, to uh, perform, collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? Alive or dead? Yeah, alive or dead. Oh, uh, absolutely. Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison, yeah. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, Iggy Pop. Link Ray. Oh, I love Link Ray. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah. Yep, great answer. I just I just had James Williamson on the uh, on the oh, show. Oh, Shangri Las would be good too. Oh, the Shangri, yeah, that's that's way out. There. Shangri Las, yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, James Williamson. Yeah, I right just on. had him on the show. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing good. He's happy. <laughs> What's that now? He's happy. He's doing yeah. all right. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy if you think that before the reunion he hadn't touched his guitar for years. That's and right. Years. That's right. Amazing. Yep, that is amazing. And those, those reunion shows were fantastic. I saw both mm -hmm. uh, the Stooges with the Ashton Brothers and the Stooges with James Williamson, and they're both just fantastic shows. Yeah, they the were Dolls reunions were fantastic as well. They were ahead of their time, I thought. You oh, know. God, yes. Yep. I was really lucky. Um, I used to hitchhike to New York City mm -hmm. in the early 70s uh, when, when the right band was playing, and I got to see the Dolls twice at Max's Kansas City, which was like really their stomping grounds, front row seat. And I've seen a hell of a lot of bands over the years, and they were the most exciting rock and roll band I mm -hmm. ever saw. Uh, the combination of their... Their, their image, which was amazingly enough, not, um, it didn't seem like it was pre-thought out. You'd think dressing as outrageous as they did would be planned, but that's pretty 
pretty much the way they looked all the time. Uh, they lived it, you know. Uh, their their cacophonous music was just to me it was just the absolute epitome of mm-hmm. rock and roll. You know, it was so loose and sloppy, and yet at the same time tight. Yeah. Uh, their their lyrics were. And, and really described the uh, the confusion of being a teenager and the excitement of being a teenager and I don't know I just uh, they blew me away and it's funny because my my favorite bands are the Doors the Dolls and the Pretty Things and they're all quite different from each other yeah you, you, did you ever see the movie Let It Ride with David Johansson in it. <clears throat> Oh, you got to say it, man. Uh, you know, Richard Dreyfus um, and uh, I mean Johansson does a fantastic job in that. He's really funny in it. it the whole movie's about him. Uh, uh, Dreyfus having a great day at the racetrack. Huh. And 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 uh, that his, doesn't sound familiar at all. His friend is David Johansson, who's kind of a loser. <laughs> he never wins anything. But <laughs> it, it's great movie. It's a great uh, movie. I'll definitely check it out. Let let it ride. Yeah, I like David cool. Johansson. I think he's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's uh, he's one of my uh, one of my heroes. <laughs> yep, for sure. So the uh, the last uh, the the reunion album uh-huh. had some really amazing material. I mean, uh, the the song um, "Maimed Happiness" right. is like one of the best songs I've ever heard. The lyrics are just amazing. I mean, he was, to me, he's one of the absolute best lyricists I've put mm-hmm. him up there with John Lennon, Bob yep. Dylan, anyone, actually. Then, then he comes out and does B- Buster Poindexter. <laughs> that I could live without. <laughs> I don't know, Hot, Hot, Hot was kind of neat. <laughs> well, you know, I'll I tell you what, though, I, I think it really helped him, because if you listen to his voice on the Dolls' first two albums, and then you listen to his voice later... <laughs> Nobody can cover Eric Burden's songs better than than he, he. I mean, he does a great job with those animal tunes. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. He's got the range for it, the voice, because you know Eric has got that deep, deep yeah. voice. No, I, I think it was a great idea for him to yeah. do mentally. It was uh, one of my favorite things that David Johansson mm-hmm. band did. Yeah, me too. So, Rudy, uh, when this virus thing ever goes away, do you think you're going to promote the album and go on? Uh, well, that was the idea. <laughs> um, being this is our 40-year anniversary, yep. we had big plans. Sure. We were going to tour uh, to promote the new album, and we have a book coming out. It's a 360-plus page photo mm-hmm. history oh, of great. the band's 40 years. That will be out before the end of the year. Awesome. Uh, that'll be out on Fan Pro. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. things in the first 
touchdowns. And, uh, you know, if, if, we, um, if we get a chance, we'll absolutely promote our 41 years because probably it won't be till next year before exactly. we play again, if we can. Um, I don't know. I mean, to me, honestly, I'm rather pessimistic about all this. I think it's, uh, I think there's a lot more to it than a virus. I think this is a political thing, and uh, I, I don't think the outcome is going to be very good. So I don't know, but we can certainly hope. Yeah, it's, it's like we want to get back on stage, no doubt about it. It's like, is there going to be a point where they're saying, "Okay, you can take your masks off"? You know what I mean? I mean, how is this well, going to happen? <laughs> there is. It's already. You yeah. can take your masks off to riot, <laughs> burn down cities. Yep. That's okay. You can do that, but don't don't try to go to a church. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. go to school. Yeah. So it's it's obviously politically motivated. Mm. It's, I don't uh, want to say too much more than that. I know what I you mean. It's like the I Twilight Zone. It, it, it's, it's 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 horrible. What's happening? I agree. It 100%. is horrible. Um, if this happened in the '60s, people would have. Protested in numbers, mm-hmm. huge numbers. Mm-hmm. We we ended the war. Yep. We ended the draft. Mm-hmm. But people today are complacent. They are complacent. Uh, yep. I can't believe how many people, how many friends of mine, yeah. have absolutely no problem with wearing a mask. Yeah. Uh, what have we been wearing them eight months now? I think. Yeah. <laughs> and they seem to be okay with wearing them forever. Yeah. It's like. I kind of forget it's on. It's no big deal. Right. I don't know. To me, it's it's. Uh, well, I just don't go along with it, you know. Yeah, that's, that's just... But I I always had a hard time fitting in with the crowd. So. Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's tough on. Man, the musicians are. I, I really feel for them. Big time. Excuse me. It's really horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, like it's it's uh, made a huge dent mm-hmm. in uh, in our earnings. Um, it takes away a lot of uh, fun. I mean, you know, it was a social thing to go out and gig. You know, meet the fans, uh, entertain mm-hmm. people. You know, make people happy. Uh, people need it. They do. People need really it. need live music. You know, uh, your soul needs live mm-hmm. music. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. I agree. I, I'm like you. I've been to a million concerts, man, and I still go to them. And it's the only thing that's... It's my release. I go see music, you know? It really is. But yep. but luckily, I, I get to interview legends like you. And, uh, and Well, thanks. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Rudy, yeah. I, I think I got you covered. we got the new album coming out. It, it's like any day now, right? Uh, you can buy it online. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's in stores. It was supposed to... The release date is officially Friday. Okay. October 16th. Uh, some people tell me it's already out. I don't know. Yeah. It's not out in Berlin. I know that. I think I saw it on Amazon. Yes, it's yeah. definitely there. And, and you and, can buy it uh, directly from Cleopatra as well. And your book is also available on Amazon, correct? Uh, yeah, the, um, the, the autobiography right. is. That's uh, called... Fuzz tone, mm-hmm. not fuzz tones. The right. fuzz tone, the fuzz tone. and uh, the first book is called um, "Raisin a Ruckus." Is the subheader, <laughs> and the second is the fuzz tone: a life at psychedelic velocity. I'm definitely going to pick that up and we're, uh, cool. promote the hell out of it. In all my, I got many, many sites out there besides being on radio, and, and I put I put all my interviews on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and, and punch in my name, you're going to see all, all my episodes are on there as well. Cool. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Rudy, thank you, man, so much for being on the show today. Uh, good my luck pleasure, with the new really. album. No, nothing but praise for me about the album. That's my style, 100%. And, cool. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm I, really glad you dig it. I do, I do hope to see you in, in the U.S. one day, hopefully. It would be great. Yeah. Spread the word. Maybe, I will. Uh, Maybe a booking agency will get a hold of us. You can always reach us at uh, at our Facebook page for the Fuzz Jones. Excellent. 
Thanks, Rudy. Take uh, care of that. Stay Thanks safe, so much man. For, for the interview. Okay, take care. Okay, man. Take All right, bye bye. Purchase the latest release by the Fuzz Tones entitled NYC. It is a great album. And if you're a lover of 60s psychedelia and punk and a mixture of just about anything rock and roll, you're going to love this album. NYC will be available on both Digipack CD and limited edition colored vinyl starting officially October 16th at Cleopatra Records. It's uh, available now, I believe, on Amazon.com. You can uh, also stream the new New York, New York song by the Fuzz Tones. That's also available right now on YouTube. For more information about Rudy Protrudy and the Fuzz Tones, visit www.fuzztones.net. That's their official website. They're also on Facebook, www.facebook.com backslash the Fuzz Tones official. Very, very special thanks to the great Billy James of Glass Onion PR for arranging this interview with Rudy Protrudy and the dynamic duo, of course, of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of interviewing the legends. We are going on five years now. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It's real news, people. And my new book is out. It's entitled The Rockstar Chronicles Series 1, Chronicles Truths, Confessions, and Wisdom from the Music Legends that set us all free. You can order yours today on hardcover or ebook at bookbaby.com. It features over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends the world will ever know. Stay safe. Be healthy, everybody. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941 877 one five five two, or visit us at publicityworksagency.com, specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio Station One.